Arise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I believe we have some adjustments to the agenda. Yes. Are you asking me for mine? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to add uh, the uh, food service task force recommendations to the agenda, please. Any other adjustments? I didn't hear what you said, Kathy. I'm sorry. Um, the food service task force recommendations. Thank you. Nothing else? Thank you. We'll add that as the last item before uh, the final comments from the public on the new business. Approval of the minutes of the September regular and special school board meetings. We have a motion. Elaine? I move that we accept the minutes of uh, our September regular uh, and special school board meetings. A second. Thank you, Trish. Any discussion on the matter? All in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Comments by our high school students. Do we have high school students here? Yes, I guess we do. Hello again. Um, my partner in crime, Rob, isn't here today. He's at the uh, play rehearsal, which uh, just got underway. I don't really know much about the play, but um, I'm sure when he returns, he'll elaborate on the subject. Um, sports seasons are uh, wrapping up. Uh, the golf team recently had the state championships, which we came in second, which was good. Um, the junior class getting excited about the Salem field trip on Friday, which uh, should be a lot of fun, except the cross country team, which I'm on, doesn't get to go because we have WMCs on Friday, but um, that'll be good. And this, Rob wanted me to add that uh, the seniors are adjusting to their carpetless hallway and hasn't really been a problem. They thought it would be, but they don't really mind it, I don't think. Uh, Homecoming was last weekend, and uh, it worked out pretty well. Um, the dance was postponed to this weekend because we couldn't find enough chaperones for it, and uh, but that didn't really seem to be a problem. It should be just as good this weekend as it would have been. And that's about it. Any questions or comments? Elaine? Um. How are things going, Connor, as far as the renovation in regards to the students' flexibility? I know you mentioned the senior hallway, but as far as gym classes and... Um, I don't have any gym classes, so I don't really know what they do for them, but the whole gym and locker room area is closed off, mm -hmm. which hasn't posed a problem to me, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what they're, what gym where gym classes are being held. I know that all the like workout stuff has been moved into the health room, which has seemed fine, but I haven't seen it to be too much of a problem. So at this point, it's been pretty minimal impact to the students. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Now our middle school students. <clears throat> I believe this is your first meeting, so if you give us your names. I'm Nora Daly. Um, hi, and I'm Elsa Mullen. Welcome. Um, the school year has begun with a very busy start. The seventh graders just returned from a great week at Kiev. The eighth graders did a fantastic job at Coastal Cleanup, and the seventh and eighth grade Halloween themed dance was held on October 1st. This coming Friday, the fifth and sixth graders will be heading to Vacation Land Bowling for their first social. It was supposed to be held in the high school, but since the renovations, we decided to have it at bowling. Um, they'll be going in two separate groups, one on the 15th and one on the 20th. The fifth grade has once again started a year-long fundraising project. 
They are collecting bottles all year long in their grade ring to raise money for their class. Mr. Solander is directing the fall play titled A Mid-Semester's Night Dream. That is going very well. The student council elections happen in September and the Cape Elizabeth Middle School Student Council is as follows. President Sierra Intel, Vice President Matt Dickinson, Historian Zoe Croft, School Board Reps Elsa Mullen and myself, Treasurer Will Pierce, eighth grade reps Marissa Tereski and Morgan Barnes, Secretary Una Donegan, Co-Vice President Jonathan Bass, seventh grade reps Maddie Spagnola and Lexi Bass, sixth grade Vice President Lynn Tarbucks and sixth grade reps Emily Donovan and Wilson LaFrog. The student council is devoted to doing one or more community service projects each month. A great season of fall sports is coming to an end and Winster sports will start mid-November. Um, and also the I-Team is going to a full day conference this Saturday and that will focus on iMovie and iPhone. Um, the beginning of the school year is getting off to a great start. The front rate the fundraiser with Sally Foster gift wrapping paper is going on now and will be at the school on October 25th. Also, the parent teacher, also parent teacher conferences are coming up soon, so there will be an early release day next Thursday and no school next Friday. The seventh graders just got back from another successful week at Key 8 and everyone enjoyed it. The seventh and eighth graders had a Halloween themed dance on October 1st and went extremely well. The fifth and sixth graders have been um, have a bowling social at Vacation Land Bowling in um, Saco on October 15th and 25th, so everyone can go. The eighth graders also, um, also were very helpful with cleaning up as uh, many beaches around Cape Elizabeth for coastal cleanup week. And uh, the fall sports uh, with tennis, field hockey, cross country, football, and soccer are coming to an end with great results and excellent participation. All is going well at the school, and everyone is looking forward to a wonderful year. Any questions? Thank you. Um, communications. Bob, we'll start off with yours, and then we'll move on to any other board members. Um, sure, thank you. Um, we have three letters from staff members who are interested in sabbatical leaves of one type or another, or one length or another, for next year. I did um, make copies of the sabbatical um, guidelines for application so that people would have those and uh, know what is expected. Um, this evening, we are, are simply um, recognizing that those three letters did come in. Um, they will be completing further application materials by the end of November, and then we will need uh, the sabbatical committee to meet and review that, and, and the sabbatical um, committee representatives were appointed, I think, last uh, June or when, when committees were appointed. And if I remember, it's yeah. Trish and yes. you, I think, uh, Kevin. So. Um, that is in your package, and, or those letters are in your package. And uh, just um, the other piece is in your package was also um, information from um, on the proposed um, Maine School Board Association um, resolutions. Um, I believe Elaine is going to be our representative at that uh, at that session. Um, so we. If you have thoughts on those two resolutions that are in the package, please make sure Elaine gets those thoughts from you. Um, and also, we need to hear from you if you are planning to attend. Um, I think we have two people who are going up for Thursday at this point. Um, but um, if, if anyone else is planning to go, we need to get that registration in so that people do have their credentials and everything. And, uh, so if you could let us know in the next day or two, it would be really helpful. If not, we'll call you. Um, and I think that's it on communications. Do any board members have a communication or anything else that they'd like to notify the public of? I have one item of note. Um, I have been meeting with Ann Swift Kayata, who is chair of the town council. Um, We've met uh, 
twice already, and they have been very productive meetings in terms of our establishing a relationship, a working relationship, and a cordial relationship at that. Um, we will be continuing to meet um, over the next few months, or perhaps um, for the full year if we, we can pull that off. Some of the things we're talking about are uh, the budgets, the budget schedules, uh, things like that. Um, again, it's been very productive, and we both continue, uh, plan to continue on those. No other communications? In that case, if you might, um, I do notice that Ted Jordan is here, and I missed that when we were doing adjustments to agenda. Is there any objection to our moving item 11A, new business, uh, up to uh, the next position? after uh, comments from the public on non-agenda items. Then we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, it's now time for comments from the public on non-agenda items, and we have uh, the first person who has uh, come to us to speak to the board, Nancy Sear. Um, if you'd state your name and address for the record and spell your last name for us. Yes, thank you for allowing me to address you. I am Nancy Sears, S-E-A-R-S, -E of 17 Linwood Street. <clears throat> I am a retired elementary school teacher. In my wonderful career of 36 years, I taught in seven different school systems. Never once, and I'm repeating that, never once, however, within that time, were the teachers or staff as a whole asked for their suggestions as how to improve the school system or the school budget. May I respectfully suggest that this school board invite all of the teachers and staff of Cape Elizabeth to present their ideas to you. I would hope that you would allow this to be done anonymously. It is very difficult when one is within the system to be critical. Therefore, to be anonymous, if one chooses to be, is very important. Of course, in these suggestions, no personality discussion should be allowed. <clears throat> there could even be monetary rewards for the best suggestions. I would be happy to help compile the ideas if you need any assistance. I shall pass my comments in writing to the chairman. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Before, yes, please, before uh, you present your uh, statement to me, um, does anybody have any clarifying questions? We're not going to have a discussion of this matter at this point, but if you have a clarifying question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Nothing? Well, in that case, I'd be more than happy to take that, and I will refer this to the Finance Subcommittee, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. And now Mr. Jordan is here with a request for the consideration of a field trip to Washington, D.C. Ted, nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, Kevin. Uh, good evening, everyone, and I'm glad to be here today. Um, I did, of course, get your permission last year to go, and then I realized uh, as I was asking Mary to schedule me for tonight's agenda, I never came back and reported to you how the last year's trip went, so why don't I start with that. Um, last year we went down to Washington, D.C. Uh, this is the Advanced Placement Government class. And while down there, we met with our own two senators, Olympia Snow and Susan Collins. We learned from them um, the way uh, their day-to-day -day lives are in terms of the committee meetings, the briefings that they get, and the very hectic lives that they live representing the people of the state of Maine. We also were invited into Tom Allen's office, our congressman, and spent an hour in there listening to him and, uh, and he asking our questions, and that was uh, very gracious of him. Um, we were also able to, from some other connections that, that I'd made, um, sit in on a breakfast with uh, the two Illinois senators, actually, Durgan and Fitzgerald. Um, it, was, it was wonderful of them to offer us into, into their breakfast meeting, and as informative as the comments we heard from the two senators, I think if you were to ask last year's seniors what they heard from 
the Chicago area high school students that were there, that was probably as eye-opening as anything. Um, they were talking about the presence of guns in their schools and cameras on the streets and, and nearby. And uh, it was just uh, a very, almost like students from different worlds to, to be having the Cape students sitting beside the Chicago students to hear about the problems that they face. We were able also to uh, sit in on a, um, the airing of the CNN show Crossfire, which was filmed on the campus of GW. Um, actually, Cape alumni, uh, Zeke Williams, is working in the program, so he was able to secure us some tickets, and, uh, and that was a great ending to our first day. Um, through some other connections that uh, Gretchen McNulty had made, we were able to, on the second day, go in and listen to um, a presentation from an undersecretary of the Department of Education. Um, we spent about an hour there. We also got a tour um, by the Supreme Court, Historical Society of the Supreme Court, and uh, he was uh, good enough to take our questions. The only other thing I think I'm leaving off is uh, through uh, the people that I met when this board sent me down to the Supreme Court Summer Institute back in 1999, um, and later, I should say, when I went to uh, Cambridge to uh, a seminar, a week-long seminar called Media and the American, De Media and the American Democracy, uh, the students were able to meet up with two foreign reporters who were based in Washington. One was from Al Jazeera and the other one was from TAS. And it was interesting to hear their perspectives and to hear about their jobs as, as bureau chiefs uh, in Washington, D.C., in our nation's capital. I anticipate this year doing all the above again. Um, when we had our open house a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned to the parents that were there that evening if they had any professional or personal contacts to let me know. And I've already lined up a meeting with um, Britt Hume at Fox News. Um, we're going to meet with some interns uh, inside the chambers of Ju Justice Stephen Breyer in the Supreme Court. And we're going to meet with a Georgetown law professor uh, who was instrumental in um, passing, nego <laughs> drafting, negotiating the um, Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, she, she counsels people on how uh, special interest groups can in influence legislation. So pending approval by the board, those are the things that we would do again on this trip. Did you folks have questions beyond that on what we're doing while we're down there? Well, I don't have any questions, but I just want to say that it sounds really great and I wish I could go. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be able to take the students there. I agree with you. We're, we're shooting for next uh, March, March 16th through the 20th. Um, last time when we went down, we took a kind of circuitous route. We had parents help sh uh, drive us down to the airport in Manchester. We flew southwest. That was the best rates at that time. And rather than flying to Reagan at International Airport, which was very expensive, we flew to BWI and then took a shuttle from there. There's a new airline in Portland that flies directly from Portland to Reagan. So um, that should make our trip a little bit easier this time and maybe less expensive as well. <coughs> Ted, when do you think you'll be back to us with uh, figures and where you'll be staying, those, that type of detail? Uh, as soon as the next month's meeting, I think. Okay. Then uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again, unless there are any concerns. Um, I, yes. We, as a school board, we are just hearing for the approval to miss days of school. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, just want to make that and, and Elaine, on this particular year, uh, we would leave Wednesday after school. We would miss Thursday school, but Friday is a workshop day, so the students wouldn't miss any school that day. So it'd be one day of school. We'll be back, we'll be back Sunday afternoon. That's the plan. Yeah. Well, I just want to say my daughter's lucky enough to be in your class, and and um, I want to thank you for not only this year but all the previous years. I think it's a great opportunity for our students and I know it takes a lot of work on your part and your chaperones. Um, and if you do need chaperones, as Rebecca said, I'm more than happy to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So I hear no objections to uh, Ted's continuing to work on this. Uh, Ted, thank you. Um, I think if it's at all possible this year after your trip is completed, if we can get some students in yeah. to talk to us, that would be uh, of great interest. I agree. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. I've got just one question. Yes, sir. How many students are you planning to? Uh, there are 18 students in the class this year. 18. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. We'll now move back to item number seven, superintendent's report. Bob.
Yeah, first of all, <clears throat> on the building projects, uh, Pond Cove um, Kindergarten Wing has, is up to where the uh, roof is going on. Um, with weather like today, the winds and whatever, it uh, sort of uh, doesn't make for, for great weather to uh, be doing that kind of work, but um, they're moving along, getting that building totally closed in so that uh, they can begin sheetrocking and, and other things inside. Um, the high school started slowly um, with the um, uh, delays in, in getting the gym floor um, stripped, but it has moved right along. It is totally stripped at this point. Um, they have half of the new floor down as far as the uh, plywood, and um, that's two layers of plywood, and um, the other half is ready to go. So they are moving along on that, and tomorrow they bring heavy equipment into the locker rooms. They've been removing the lockers and taking out other fixtures, uh, making sure that there was no other asbestos that they were not aware of in there, and are now ready to uh, go full tilt in the locker rooms to clean out that area and be ready to start rebuilding the locker room. So uh, they're moving along. Um, we're very comfortable with their progress and we're feeling good about you know what's getting done. Um, main, in your package um, for tonight was a, a, uh, a document from uh, called Preliminary Assessment of Legal Issues Involved in the Pulaski Tax Cap Legislation. It was from a meeting uh, that MSMA held up in Augusta a week ago, and it cites many of the um, questions that will be left if the Pulaski measure passes. Um, everything from um, certain terms that were used because they were used in the California law that are not defined in Maine law, and what do they really mean for us. And we've talked about some of those, but I thought it was a pretty interesting piece, so I did put it in your package. Um, if you are interested and available, there will be a meeting to explain essential programs and services, the EPS system that's coming in for financing schools effective next year, and that will be held at um, PATHS, um, the vocational school in Portland, on November 16th. It's a Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 8.30. And it's open to the public, anybody is welcome, but it will be explaining exactly how they will calculate the monies that they will be uh, planning to send to Cape Elizabeth and other school districts. So we, uh, um, I will be there, and if you are interested and are available, it probably would be worth sort of finding out how that's going to work. Um, we had some interesting news from Project SMART, and SMART is spelled S-M-A-R-R-R-T. Um, but um, they have applied for and received a $500,000 grant for emergency response and crisis management for Cumberland County school districts over the next 18 months. I know Henry had come to me with some information from one of his neighbors who was interested in upgrading the uh, plan, and I know there was a meeting held at the high school on um, that work, but this is uh, money that could certainly help with those kinds of efforts and uh, uh, make sure that they do get completed. So um, that is a, a grant that has been funded. Um, I have received a copy uh, at our last workshop. Sarah talked about the reasons for applying for a waiver. Um, she did complete that waiver application. Um, so this is Sarah Simmons, our curriculum person, and uh, that did get to the state by the deadline of October 1st. So uh, we are waiting to hear whether or not they will approve a waiver for us or not. Um, in a separate meeting, I met with the superintendents from Westbrook, Wyndham, Sad Six, Scarborough, and Gorham regarding possibilities of future cooperative ventures um, last week. Um, we found many possible areas that we'd like to pursue, and we'll be meeting again the first week in November. So I'll keep you informed on those kinds of meetings. Um, I mentioned earlier we do need account for the uh, Maine School Board Association Conference. Um, there will be a special school board workshop this Friday, um, 9 o'clock, um, here in the uh, Jordan uh, Conference Room, and that is for 
the establishing of school board goals, which we didn't get to earlier and uh, are looking forward to getting to at that point. Susan O'Brien will be um, coming up next Monday. She'll be here for about half the day. And uh, if you have, um, uh, she basically, the basic plan is that she wants to uh, have lunch and find out what's been going on in the school district and get caught up a little bit and then spend um, some time in the schools themselves. We um, uh, tentatively had made arrangements for her to be interviewed, but that is not going to work for this one, so we've put it off until the next time she comes up. So um, we will, that will be happening next Monday. And I think that's everything, unless you have questions. I have a question, Bob. You yes. said you met with the superintendents of Wyndham, SAD6, Gorham, et cetera, to discuss areas of cooperation. I'm just curious, what are some of those areas? Um, we, we talked about everything from financial buying, purchasing power, to um, curriculum work, uh, particularly the, the work for the uh, local assessment systems. And, and uh, I know that Sarah already cooperates with some of those districts and some other districts in um, getting that information. We talked about um, establishing standards um, for, do you do them for just one district, your own district, or do you do them for a region um, where everybody sort of has the same expectations? It's interesting if you put the number of students that are in those school districts together, we have approximately one-tenth of the entire student population of the state of Maine in those six school districts. So it's an interesting um, uh, buying power-wise and, and in many different uh, aspects to think about what, what kind of um, strength that kind of a group might have and what kind of um, opportunities there might be. Um, and also opportunities for anything from, um, you know, there was talk about doing some special ed together. Well, would, are there poss more possibilities that way than separately. So we, we sort of just did an initial brainstorming um, and none of those are carved in concrete. Um, I think everybody wants to go into it with a sense of um, we can opt into anything we want to opt into, we can opt out of anything we don't particularly want to be part of. So that you know, you're not tied into doing something because a majority of the districts there want to do something. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. Anyone else? Thank you, Bob. We'll now move on to the uh, principal reports and we'll begin with the high school. Jeff? Good evening. I just have a few things. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of programs and or teachers at the high school who have received some recognition that I think hasn't been mentioned in the past. One is that Roger Rio, one of our math teachers, um, who is our statistics guru in the high school, um, is going down tomorrow to the Net NCTM, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics Eastern Regional Meeting to present um, at a conference about the use of variations in teaching statistics. Don't ask me any questions about that. <laughs> That's what he told me. Um, and he was invited to come down um, because some folks do some networking that the math teachers did. Um, some folks were impressed with some of the work that Roger has done with his students um, and the use of that concept in teaching statistics. So it's a nice coup for Roger. Um, last, well, at the end of September, a couple of weeks ago, we also got word uh, from the National Forensic League, which is one of the two national organizations that um, um, are national debate, speech, and debate organizations uh, that Cape Elizabeth High School has belonged to for some time, and most high schools uh, belong to. Um, we got word that we were presented with an award called the Leading Chapter Award. Uh, for the state of Maine in speech and debate, um, there's one school in the state, which is us, uh, who received that award, um, and we are one of 103 schools nationwide that has received that award. So it's a nice, it's a nice award in recognition of the number of students who have been involved in speech and debate and the awards that have been received over the last five to eight years. So it's a, it's a nice thing. 
Um, and I wanted to mention in particular the work of our, our current coaches, Hannah Jones and Gretchen McNulty, for their work for the, with the speech and debate team. Um, it is the, many people are not aware, it is the longest interscholastic competitive season uh, of any um, activities at the high school level in Maine. It goes from about this weekend until sometime in late May, actually, depending on how far kids go towards nationals. We began the process today of distributing laptops to ninth graders. Um, and at this point, uh, Gary Lenoy was in with his technology crew, and they, they have distributed laptops to about a little bit over 60% of ninth graders today. I'm guessing we'll be up to about 80% tomorrow. Um, and that is going well. Um, some students um, forgot to bring in their forms today, um, and so that's why some whose classes went to get the laptops weren't able to get them. My guess is that that would be a good reminder, and people will bring in their forms tomorrow, and we'll get, uh, we'll get way up there. Um, tomorrow is actually our, our, our day when, in the morning, our 10th and 11th graders take the PSATs which is the practice SAT exam that kids take as sophomores and juniors. And while the 10th and 11th graders are taking the PSATs, <coughs> our guidance counselors are overseeing a, a, um, uh, a project with the 9th graders with using the laptops um, in, as in research in particular careers that the students have an interest in. And it's sort of a first step in trying to do more with the ninth graders and do more around the issue of career exploration, career um, getting information out about you know what kind of um, collegiate backgrounds are required, what kind of majors for certain kinds of occupations that are out there. Um, and that really is made possible because of the addition of a third guidance counselor so that um, counselors are really able to spend more time, which is one of their top goals with the younger kids looking at careers, um, post-secondary options, and not just focusing um, as, not exclusively, but just focusing so much of their time and effort around college planning. Um, and Connor uh, from the high school mentioned that we did have homecoming this past week. We are, uh, we did disappoint some students uh, because we postponed the dance, because uh, we didn't um, reach the thresholds that we've been wanting to reach for the last couple of years with the homecoming dance, which has occasionally been a problem in the past. Um, and I think that there was, um, I think one of the issues, the major issue was we were lacking parents, uh, but we were also more importantly lacking staff members compared to the numbers that we try to get. And I have a feeling that a lot of that has to do with the Columbus Day weekend. Um, and a lot of people, including a lot of staff members, had plans to be elsewhere. So we're hopeful that we'll be able to get the numbers so that the dance can proceed this weekend. Um, but we do want to make sure that it happens in a way that we feel comfortable with um, and not have any issues come up that we don't, that we have to deal with after the fact. And that is really it. Any questions for Jeff or comments? I have a comment. I just want to say I, I think that the activity that you have planned for tomorrow morning with the ninth graders sounds really interesting and exciting and I appreciate the work of the guidance counselors to try something new and to pull that together for the students. So pass that along to them. They are, they are hoping that the laptop distribution gets up to about 80 percent so, <laughs> yeah. um, to, 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 so that uh, they can pull that off. But it will go well um, and the students will have those. It will be exciting to put those laptops to use. It was interesting as I was leaving school today right outside in the main lobby outside my office. There were about a half dozen ninth graders who were working with their laptops and familiarizing themselves with them already. So that was really neat to see. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Nancy? Good evening. Oh, and first of all, I want to compliment um, Nora and Elta. They did a great job telling you about the spirit and energy of the middle school. It always makes my job much easier when we have such competent reporters. So, ladies, great first job and well done. We'll look for you to do that continually, I think. I'd like to um, just share a couple of things with you, like Jeff. Um, first of all, talk about a staff member uh, that coming off you, in your packet tonight, you had letters of people who were intending to perhaps apply for sabbaticals. And two years ago, um, the board granted Susan Dana, one of our world language teachers, a sabbatical for the spring semester. 
For those of you who were on the board at that time, you might recall that her work involved finding some original Spanish games to bring and to enhance the instruction that she was doing. And she needed to travel to places outside of Maine where you could find these um, authentic games. Well, Susan did that, and um, she did it so well that this summer she was invited to present at an international conference her work around those games and how she uses them in her classroom. And when you think of an international conference of world language teachers and the person who was one of the prime presenters is a teacher from Maine who teaches Spanish, um, it's really quite an accomplishment uh, for her to be invited to do that. Following up on that, she was also invited to present in early mid-September at the Northeast Regional Conference at Yale University her same presentation or a very similar presentation, but that's a direct result of it certainly had an impact on our students' learning and their opportunities, but also professional development for Susan as she goes out and presents to a much larger audience than just her own colleagues. So we celebrate that with Susan. Today we were visited by Pam Buffington, who is a professional development uh, person. She works with the Educational Development Center out of Newton, Massachusetts. And we're working with Pam for the next two years as part of the MISTEM project. If you look back in your packet from last time, one of the things we did over the summer is all the seventh and eighth grade math teachers participated in this project. And MISTEM is M-I-S-T-M, and it's Main Impact Study of Technology in Mathematics. And what it's really looking at the efficacy of providing professional development for teachers and then what the direct impact that has on students and their learning and student work um, as an outgrowth for this. And uh, part of Pam's visit today was really just a check-in with us for how are things going so far. Our students in the seventh and eighth grade and all the math classes have participated in a survey assessment. Um, the teachers have done that. They are participating in an online course right now. Um, they all have peer partners from most of our teachers, I think, have peer partners from Marshwood, um, which is in the southern part of the state, and let's see, Marshwood, York, and Westbrook. I believe. Um, and they will be having an online um, conversation back and forth, plus they'll visit their schools once and these people will come to our school at least one time. Um, and it was really fascinating. I had a chance to sit in and listen to some of their conversations, the things that they're um, doing, um, the work on the technology is that Pam and her group organize lessons called applets and they come and they enhance our instruction or sometimes replace perhaps a work lesson in a math book. Um, and for many of our students who are more visual learners, they can not only see what the equation is and what the statement is in mathematics, but they can also visual, see the visual of it um, and make it work. And it's really quite exciting. And I think we're looking forward to lots of improved mathematical thinking and a real difference in our student work um, as a result of being part of this project. And my one other thing is just to follow up a reminder. Um, Nora and um, Elsa reminded you of this too. We do have our first play. This is a fall play. We've added this this year. We didn't add any hours or anything like that. It's using our time that we have differently for co-curricular activities. Um, but it is called The Midsummer Night's Midterm. It's a Shakespearean play written for middle school students. And I went in on a rehearsal today, and it's um, quite exciting. And we'd just like to invite all of you as part of our appreciation for the time that you give to the um, school board will be sending you two complimentary tickets uh, to this event. And uh, we do have performances in the afternoon of November 3rd, which is a Wednesday, and then evening performances on the 4th and the 5th. And we hope that um, you can come and see uh, what all of your efforts result in. It's middle school students doing something that they care about, something that's brand new for some of them, and doing their very best work at that moment in time. So um, we hope that some of you can join us. And any questions? I had, a, I had a comment. Hearing about Susan Day and a sabbatical really helps to bring to life what a sabbatical can mean, not only to the teacher, but really for our students. And I don't know if this has routinely you know, been done, but I don't remember last year hearing any sabbatical reports. But I would really like to suggest that routinely we hear, I don't think that there are that many teachers who go out on sabbatical here each year, that mm -hmm. we could just have a brief report from each of the teachers that we grant a sabbatical to, because right now sure. we have before us three, three different requests, and I think that that helps, helps us to understand 
how important that might be for our whole learning community. So i just like us to keep in mind doing that. Right. I, I think you'll find that the teachers would like to come and share with you because the sabbatical is a chance for them to do something they really care about, and it's just that magic finding the time, but perhaps it will weave into the work of the communication committee as well, too, and inviting people to come and share mm -hmm. for a brief moment in time some of the things that they're doing. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. Tom? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, now that's almost mid-October, I thought I would just uh, give you an overview of how school has begun for Pond Cove this year. A quick comment on the enrollment figures. You'll notice in your board packet that uh, the K-4 enrollment is up about 14 students, but I'd also like to point out that the grades 1 through 4 is up 24 students, which means um, that construction project came along just in time. Bob's already reported to you what's going on outside the school with the building coming along. Inside, I want to compliment everybody on the staff, kids and students, for being so flexible as they've adapted to the construction project. It means rerouting traffic and having to squeeze into rooms here and there, but we just fit. We're looking forward to reclaiming the science health room and the, our conference room in February, but overall, people have done a nice job. And I think overall, the school is a little bit quieter and more comfortable than it was last year with the students marching down the long hall. They're very sensitive to the teaching and learning that's going on in the classrooms. Uh, a word about the climate committee. I used to report regularly on what the climate committee was doing. And I noticed from some of your comments that some of you follow Pond Cove through the newsletter, which is uh, posted on the website. So you know that the climate committee is uh, is back again. And uh, Rebecca took the time to come to our reorganizational meeting a couple of weeks ago. I was very pleased at the turnout. We had uh, staff volunteers from each grade level and team, and so many parents, we weren't quite sure what to do. But it all resolved itself very well by the end. So the uh, Climate Committee is back in slightly revised and probably improved form. A uh, major goal for the committee has been and will continue to be communication with uh, parent school communication, the community at large, and with you. So I will update on you, uh, give you regular updates at this forum on what the Climate Committee is up to. We also, and probably this goes along with the Climate Committee, we spent last uh, week's faculty committee talking about our teacher attitudes uh, toward parent-student conferences, what it means to sit down and have an intimate conversation with parents about their uh, children. Uh, I think it really helped us approach this as a way of defining the mutual grounds of responsibility between uh, school and parents. So um, that, as the middle school kids mentioned, parent-teacher conference time is officially coming up last week. And I think we've made a good, uh, next week, I think we made a good start. Um, we can't have a meeting without mentioning a little bit about the local assessment system. I've heard over and over this year, what would we do without the Wednesday late starts? And that's, uh, that's true. It's a, no matter how much preparation we've done, we still need the time to sit down together, sort things out, and make the legal, technical requirements um, be practical applications in the classroom. I really want to compliment uh, Sarah for using the curriculum, curriculum instruction assessment team members, the CIA team members, to help distribute both the responsibility and the leadership throughout the school. At Pond Cove, that's Amy Kieran, Linda Sigmund, um, Janet Amberger, Linda Alfiero, Sue Welch, and I think Roxy Johnson. It's really worked very well. Um, we had two Wednesdays in a row to work on that. And, we're, and finally, I think we can, we can say we're really uh, not just making progress, but the whole thing is making sense. You heard from Bob's report last month that uh, there are, there's a lot of professional development going on during the summer. We ch changed our emphasis a little bit this year at Pond Cove to what I guess we'd call front-loading professional development. We had intergrade level team meetings in August focusing on writing instruction K through 4 around published but uh, practitioner-based material in writing. Uh, now, with the help of the teacher leader, we're seeing results already um, during the year, both in terms of student and teacher learning about this. We hope, uh, I've reported before about our lesson study initiatives over the past few years. Last year, every teacher was involved in it. 
this year out of respect for their time and the demands of the local assessment system. We're going to back off a little bit and have a steering committee be in charge of lesson study and li very likely target writing instruction, go through a series of lessons to get feedback about the lessons and see just what results we're getting from the kids and the teachers. Uh, instrumental in this will be the teacher leader position, which so far is going quite well. So that's what's going on at Pond Cove. Questions for Tom? Comments? Thanks. Thank you, Tom. On to committee reports. Um, we'll begin with the Finance Subcommittee. Kathy? The Finance Subcommittee met this evening at 7 o'clock where we uh, signed warrants. We reviewed uh, recommendations by the Food Service Task Force Committee. We also discussed, but didn't finish discussing, um, the Finance Committee uh, makeup and we're going to be looking at putting together a job description for the Finance Committee and presumably that will help us to determine how many people we will have on the committee and how will that will break down in terms of the total school uh, body versus uh, a, a smaller group. Uh, would you like me to save the food service information for later? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Policy subcommittee, Ann? Policy committee met on October 5th. First item on our agenda was to um, discuss the revisions of Section A, which we presented at last month's meeting, and we'll be presenting Section A for second reading later on this evening. Um, there was also some specific policy updates that we discussed. Um, one is the Allergy Management Task Force, which is a subcommittee of the Policy Committee. Um, and there is a more, I guess, another place for a report on that later on this evening, so I'll be giving that later. Um, we also discussed the name badge policy, which Bob has drafted and presented, and that will be presented later this evening for first reading. Um, Jeff presented a first draft of a policy on student memorials on, in the school and on schools, school grounds that was crafted by the high school crisis response team. We'll be discussing that more at our November meeting. And the last specific policy was something that the high school student advisory committee had drafted and given to Jeff at the end of last year on the substance abuse policy. And the committee will be taking a look at that in subsequent meetings as well. Um, let's see, the other um, business that's being conducted um, in small groups from the policy committee is section I, which is instruction. The administrators have been taking a close look at that and the entire policy committee will be looking at that at our November meeting. And then the other thing that we're gonna be working on is section B, which is board governance and operations. The, just the board will be getting work on that section in the next month or so. Thanks. Thank you. Communications Committee, Rebecca. Um, yeah, the Communications Committee met uh, with the former chair of the Communications, Ann Belden, to get a sense of um, perspective and context for the action plan that was approved last spring. And we have begun to implement it by contacting the various parent-teacher organizations or parent organizations and also um, discussing with the principals of the buildings as to how to invite teachers to come to the school board and give presentations on any items of interest. And we've also made contact with all the f um, previous other committee members and all but one have um, agreed to serve. Um, we're still waiting to hear um, whether there's somebody from the high school who would be willing to work on the committee with us. And Jeff, I'd probably will try to get in contact with you about that. Um, we're very excited about moving forward and working on the plan that was approved and also looking forward to um, some new ideas. And until we flesh out that final member of the committee, we have yet to set a new date. <coughs> but we'll make sure everybody knows when that is. Any questions or comments for Rebecca? Great. The next item is pass. That's me. Um, 
the General Advisory Committee met this month um, on a number of topics. The first is uh, sad news that the uh, biotech instructor has uh, retired. We were unable to replace the instructor and we have now opted to put that entire program on hold um, for the time being pending um, uh, an analysis of the budget impact um, once the uh, November election is taken care of. Um, we are also reviewing, I unfortunately had to institute a uh, low enrollment program review for fashion and retail merchandising and graphic arts, uh, which will begin, I believe Bob is serving on that committee with a number of other people, um, to take a look and see what we need to do to preserve those programs or drop them. Um, in addition, we have named the budget subcommittee. I will be acting in an ex officio capacity this year. Um, and we are also uh, discussing, at my request, the election of a vice chair um, and changing a change to the Constitution to accommodate that position. Uh, we will be meeting again in November, and I look to my colleagues on the board for a stand-in. Um, if you would contact me, uh, I will need a stand-in for myself uh, in November. That's it on the uh, path front. Any questions? Kevin, if I could, I'd just like to mention that uh, I think it was Sunday's newspaper carried an article on their mini course program that they have inst instituted or they have, um, they are trying out this year with two, the two Portland high schools. And uh, it offers some interesting possibilities for our kids for the future. Um, because if somebody could go for half a morning instead of a whole morning or half an afternoon, it, um, it could certainly offer some, some more options for kids who are really hands-on. But um, that's just in its pilot phase, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, it's not easy to try to, I can't remember how many different schools are involved in paths, and they have to try to coordinate all their schedules to make it work, and it's, uh, it's not very easy. We have nine sending districts and uh, probably four or five other districts that uh, pay tuition for their students to attend. Kevin. Yes, Elaine. I have a, a, a question. Um, I guess I hadn't thought about it that much, but uh, after the election and if uh, question one does pass, what are the implications to the past programs in regards to the sending districts and I think the implications are really no different um, for us than they are for anyone else the question is going to be the primary question will be first will we continue to send students to pass mm -hmm. that is the big question and that's where the the largest budget impact is on that decision the second budget decision is whether or not to expand current programming and we have a great deal more flexibility with that than we uh, uh, simply to freeze that for, for a period of time. But the important decision, um, once Pileski has decided, is whether or not we will continue to send students. Um, I'm not going to make a recommendation at this point, but I will um, come November. Just thank you. Any other questions relative to pass? In that case, we will go back to Kathy for her report on the Food Service Task Force. Okay, the Food Service Task Force met on uh, October 5th, and the uh, individuals on the, the task force are Bob Lyman, Paulina Portria, Sue King, and myself. We uh, reviewed where we stood uh, in terms of overdue status on food accounts, and we made um, recommendations to the school board, which were reviewed this evening at the finance uh, subcommittee. Should I read what we recommended and then later on? Sure. Okay. Yeah. The recommendations as of October 5th were as follows. 
one if a lunch account is overdrawn twenty dollars or more the child will not be allowed to register for community service programs sports activities or co curricular activities until the account is back in a positive status two if a lunch account is overdrawn twenty dollars or more the child will be required to call their parents to remind them of the overdue payment and then return to the back of the lunch line to receive a prepackaged brown bag lunch selected by the lunch personnel. Prior to implementing any of the above, a letter would go out to all parents via mail letting them know of the change in procedures. As of October 5th, letters had been sent out to overdrawn accounts with a second more urgent letter signed by the superintendent being planned for October 5th. For the accounts where families have moved out of town, a pre-collection letter will be sent prior to turning over those accounts to a collection agency. We have contacted an agency and they have agreed to a 30% fee. The overdue status of all accounts as of September 30th was $10,772.40. The overdue status of the accounts was $8,774.90 as of September 13th, showing an increase in monies owed by $1,997.50 in two weeks. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions? We'll enter into a fuller discussion of this uh, recommendation under new business. I'm sorry. I actually have a question relating to something else sure. underneath the food services. Um, there is a copy of the report. Um, do the figures in this reflect the new prices as approved by the state? And am I correct in seeing that we're still losing money? Yes. Do we know why? Are we not? Um, has any, uh, and, and I'll follow that up with, has, have we actually completed the exercise of figuring out on average what the cost is per lunch? Two different questions there. Kind of. um, the, the state gave us a per, per meal cost for last year of $1.68, I believe, was the, the, um, the dollar figure that they gave us, that they came up with for the full year. The figure was much higher for the month of September because you had all of the labor from the summer included getting ready to start the school, plus all the bulk purchasing that has been done. So inventory is up substantially as well. So there are some, some factors that make it very hard to say, gee, this is an actual cost and it, it, this is the figure that we're up. We, are, we do have more people owing money in the first two weeks than we had in the previous, um, you know, coming into this. But we don't know if that happened other years or not because we never tracked it for from the beginning of the year. Kathy, I, you may want to answer. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you said. And, and I'm, these dollar figures would include that lunches are at 175 now versus 150. I think maybe that was part of your question before. Yep, so we need to give it probably another month before we s determine whether or not we're actually covering our costs. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments on that issue? No, in that case, I think Ann will deal with the Food Allergy Management Task Force. Okay, our Allergy Management Task Force met on September 20th, and this is a subcommittee, as I said earlier, of the um, policy committee. And it's, it's a very short-term committee. We hope to have a recommendation to the full policy committee in November. Currently, it's comprised of three school board members, two administrators, two school nurses, and five parents representing all three schools. Um, the purpose of the committee is to um, well, really look at the issue of allergy management um, within our school system. And so we're looking at the guidelines that currently exist, not that guidelines are really um, a board decision, but because um, parents have brought questions forward about how the guidelines are administered and what the guidelines are, we thought we would review the guidelines, but more importantly, it's really to put together a policy for our whole school district on allergy management, which will then guide the development of um, other procedures. 
Um, Holly Harris, who's one of our nurses who is on the committee, did present some interesting statistics, and I'm just going to toss those out just so that people understand what numbers we're talking about, what the magnitude of the issue is. Currently, we have seven high school students who have EpiPens available to them. We have nine middle, middle school students who have EpiPens available to them, and 22 Pond Cove students. Um, of those 22 Pond Cove students, six actually carry them on their person at all times. So those are just kinds of the kinds of numbers that, that we're dealing with in our schools. Um, Mostly we discuss the guidelines. A group of parents have put together a set of their own guidelines that they'd like the committee to consider, which um, we began taking a look at a little bit and we'll look at in more detail at our next meeting. And we also discuss the, one of the really the key underlying issues of, of allergy management that all schools have to deal with is um, how do you handle foods that some of your students are seriously allergic to. And so basically that comes down to the issue of do you ban certain food, foods in your school or do you not? Um, we were able to actually come to a consensus at our meeting that we are going to take the stand and probably make the recommendation that we not ban schools in our food. And I'd just like to say that that is a stand that is supported by many national organizations that deal with this issue across the country. Um, that's pretty much it. We're actually meeting early tomorrow morning to continue work on this policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Any questions, comments? In that case, we'll move on to unfinished business which is consideration of policies for second reading, and I will turn this directly over to Ann. Um, okay, well, in your package you have the revised Section A, which we discussed last time, and I guess what I'd like to do is just pull out the issues that the board wanted us to reconsider, which we did, in fact, do at our last meeting. Um, and the first one comes up first on the first page, and um, these have, have not been numbered, so it might be a little difficult to I'm find. sorry, you asked me to number the back <laughs> um, But if you see us flipping through all these pages, there are a lot of them to look through, so that's why. But anyway, one of the, one of the discussion items that we had at our last meeting was um, what in, in the non-discrimination equal opportunity file section AC, which is the very first page of your packet here on policies, um, whether or not we wanted to have a parents and family put into all the categories, which this would be apropos within that policy. And so as you can see in your packet, a parents in, and family are included along with race, color, sex, religion, ancestry, national origin, age, sexual discrimination, marital status, or disability. So the discussion of the group was to include all of those. And they are supposed to be included where, wherever you see those. I did find one place where a uh, few of them were not included. So I think if we can just assume that we'll be going through this again before it's you know typed and put into our manuals, that all of those classes will be included in all of the policies where they, you know, where it's pertinent. So if you find a policy where that's left out, that's just because it's a typo. All right, the other one, the next one is um, file ACAA-R about the ninth page back in the... And to the top of that says complaint handling and investigation. The title of the policy, which is on the preceding page, is student discrimination and harassment complaint procedure. Um, so there are two, two things on this page. Is it, has everybody found that page that I'm referring mm -hmm. to? Yep. Okay, so the first one was that A and B were supposed to have been switched, and they just weren't. So we're gonna we're gonna switch those. So B now becomes A, and A is B. 
The second item that we had discussion on at our last meeting was number 4C4. And as you can see in red, we did add that sentence. Um, and so that is something new that was from the discussion that we had at last month's meeting. Okay. Those are the only other real changes from the policies the last time. On, there was one question that um, Rebecca submitted after our meeting last month, and it had to do with um, the last policy in this section, which is ADAA, which is School System Commitment to Standards for Ethical and Responsible Behavior. We're recommending that this be deleted. And Rebecca, if you'd like to, if you'd like to pose your question. Sure. Um, my question was, it, um, the comment from the attorneys was, since there is already a code of conduct, there is no need to maintain this policy. And my my question was, um, is a code of conduct something that is static, or is it something that will change through time? And if it does change through time, then I believe we need some sort of policy that will address how we review and potentially revise the code of conduct for our district. So I actually, in fact, uh, disagree with the attorneys on this one. But Bob, in reviewing the code of conduct, maybe you can speak to that. Because yeah. we, did, we did raise this issue at our meeting. Right. Um, what I did was to go back and go through this, the, uh, it's called the family handbook, I believe, not the student handbook um, at the uh, high school level. And um, the code of conduct is very clear and it is reviewed every single year when that comes out. Um, um, there are also other pieces to it on, on um, the ethics of, of, uh, of um, copying people's papers and some of those kinds of things. but. Um, it is a very clear document, and it is on the website. In fact, I, I believe the handbook was not printed this year, but was put on the, the website. So, you know, that would be a good place to review that. Um, but it is quite detailed, and it is, is um, very specific as to... Who is it reviewed by currently? Who reviews the uh, handbook, Jeff? Um, that, that's just different from what the, this policy says. So I just want to make sure that we're all clear that the school board no longer thinks it has a role in reviewing the code of conduct for our schools that it will happen on the, in the building level and it will not come to us. If we're going to become involved in a conversation on this particular policy, what I would like to do is first get a motion for all the other policies for second reading, get those out of the way, and then a motion and second for this policy so we can have a, an appropriate discussion. I do. I have a question on one of the other ones. I don't know if you want it now or later. Might as well do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's it's the first one that you mentioned. The file AC, the non-discrimination equal opportunity, and the maybe you could explain how the policy committee came to the conclusion that the reference to appearance and family status should be put in there when the attorney recommended that it be removed because it could be too broadly interpreted and I I guess I'm concerned that I would share that uh, opinion because if in fact you got to a situation that somebody was saying they were being discriminated against um, appearance and family status is a broad subject so I'm just wondering if you, I'm assuming you had the conversation and if you could just share with me how that went we did. Actually, we had a lengthy conversation about that, and we sort of thought it through from, you know, different angles. And what we finally ended up 
think it was even though they are recommending because it is fairly broad and it is hard to specifically define, but we thought that as a school system we wanted to take the stand that we didn't want to tolerate any kind of discrimination. And that's basically where we came from. I, do you want to add anything, Bob? Well, only that um, it had been in several of the policies for a number of years and has never been an issue. Um, and that was sort of another piece that we looked at um, as we thought about, gee, is this going to be problematic? I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, actually well, we implementation. We had the same wonder, believe me. I mean, age is age. Mm -hmm. Your age is what your age is. Your appearance is a subjective, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. like your appearance, but I like yours and I, you know, but that's my, that's my opinion and not necessarily somebody else's. And how do you measure that? And I don't know how you measure appearance and family status. Fam and family status, I'm thinking, um, you know, again, what, what are we saying? Um, I'm not sure I understand what we're saying. Fam what, what, what is family status? Are we saying, you know, traditional family, non-traditional family? So I'm just worried about the ambiguity of having it in there. I'm not saying I want, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that we shouldn't be discriminating about, you know, to anybody for anything, but how do we define it when we, when we put those words and I'm worried about the being too broad. I, before we continue, I think it's appropriate now to start taking motions because right. we're getting into substantive conversation about policy. Okay. Um, are there any other policies other than the two that were raised that uh, require further discussion? Um, I, th I think if we're going to have this conversation about AC, then it's potentially going to come up again in the student discrimination and harassment complaint, because it has some of the same language. Well, the same language is throughout. Yeah. I mean, it's in many places. Right. So I think this is kind of a wide-reaching conversation. Well, I, you know, Kelly, I think last it like, came up at our meeting last, you know, last month, and so we did. We really did talk about it, and I, I can understand what you're saying. But we did. We spoke about it for quite a while, and we, when we looked at it, you know, in all those different ways, we just thought that this was what we really wanted to have in our in our policies across the board. So, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that I'm not sure that I can, you may not ag agree with that and may want to vote differently, but I don't know if we want to have a lot of, a lot more discussion, do we, on that particular item, unless you want us to take well, Essentially, we can have all the discussion that the rest of the board feels is necessary and appropriate. That's why I want it now to go into a motion. Um, so we can have that discussion and, and, and the exchange back and forth mm -hmm. if that turns out to be appropriate. Well, why don't we have a motion for all those policies except for the code of conduct since this does seem to, this issue it tends to be more global in nature. And during, after the second, then we can have this discussion. But I think we, we do need to recognize that that goes across a lot of the policies. Right, so I'm we just so saying, why don't we have a motion for all of them except code of conduct? And then we can have this conversation about appearance and yeah. family. Do you want to go ahead and make that motion? Um, I move that we accept the policies uh, presented tonight in Section A with the exception of the code of conduct policy, which is the last one. Um, and these would be as presented this evening with the changes that I outlined that were missing or typos in the beginning. Do we have a second? I second. Thank you, Elaine. Now it's time for conversation. And it sounds to me that the conversation is really focuses around uh, the addition of certain protected classes that the uh, policy committee is determined should be a protected class. Um, I, I support the inclusion of appearance and family status. My only question is, 
have we had a conversation with our attorneys as to what is the real concern about the fact that it can be broadly interpreted outside the categories? What are the actual repercussions of that? Uh, we've had that conversation, and the conversation basically centers around somebody bringing up that they were discriminated against by, because of their appearance, whether it's something they were wearing, the way they looked, any, any number of different things. And it's really hard to define. It's not defined in law like the other factors are. Um, that Those two or three items that we were adding back in so that was be, their issue. So it would be hard for that, the complainee to prove, or it would be hard for us to or, or whoever to evaluate? It would be both. hard to evaluate hard because to evaluate. there's no legal definition of those. As a point of information, all of these policies, almost all of these policies that we're currently reviewing refer to sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is not a protected class. It was the broad-based decision of this school, or not this school board, but a prior school board, that that board would include sexual orientation as um, appropriate to these policies, although they are not specifically protected in law. And that has always been in there. And one of the things that I noted in my review was that sexual orientation was not being deleted, as was um, appearance and uh, family status, which didn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. There any further discussion on this? I don't know if this is worth we anguished over this discussion in the policy committee meeting, but one statement that I'm noticing. Um, under ACA, under harassment and sexual harassment of students, after it goes through and lists all of these categories, it does make a statement which made me feel better, and I just don't know whether perhaps we need to add it to this first paragraph, which says, such conduct is a violation of board policy and may. That was, we discussed the word may at length. May constitute illegal discrimination under state and federal law. So it seemed to say it may, but we're not guaranteeing that all of these will be protected under law. But we as a school board want to create an environment in which we don't want any of these behaviors to be condoned. So, I, so we sort of hung our hat, or I did, on the may to sort of address both of the issues that have come up right now. I don't know if you want to put that statement after any after all of the blanket statements that say what, that list what the different discrimination behaviors are that we want that are are prohibited I, I, I appreciate that information because I'd be more comfortable with that because what we're looking at I mean if we have a policy and the policy is so broad that it can't be enforced because it can't be completely defined, then I think we run the risk on behalf of the board as well as maybe a student or family of, of you know, running into a problem if, if, if a problem ever came up. Um, if, a, if a family felt they'd been discriminated against because of appearance, how are we going to enforce, not enforce, prove, disprove that kind of thing, um, and it's not our and it's not our job to disprove that. I mean, it could if it went to a court of law. Of course, it's 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 up to the courts. But if we did add the word may in there, we're saying, then we're saying what what Anne was just saying is we don't want any discrimination. Period. But we're not saying, at the same time, we're not saying that we are defining what all discrimination is because in fact we're not. It's defined by the courts. I guess so. I, I'm saying I'm more I'm more comfortable if it, if we had something like that in it. Um, maybe not explaining myself well, but well, I mean we can easily do that. We could add that. 
I think it appears in some. I just know it was in that one, but it did not appear in that first paragraph. So that, that makes sense to me when the way you explained it. Does that does that help other people? So would you put something at the end of the first paragraph where it says, or dis you know, family or marital status or disability are prohibited and may be illegal? Is that kind of I think if we just put the same statement, mm -hmm. if you go to ACA, the same statement that follows that definition, it just says such conduct is a violation of board policy and may constitute illegal discrimination. I think if we use that same verbiage in all the policies that lists them, it kind of covers us and addresses what our we're advocating mm -hmm. as a board, but also addresses some of this may not be covered in by the courts. So then you're still making the statement you want to make, but we're not saying that it necessarily would hold up in the court of law. Yeah. So we could go through and just add that sentence in wherever those classes are listed. Mm -hmm. We have an emotion, a motion to amend the original motion to include that language. Trish. Help me if I don't do that right. <laughs> I move that we amend the original motion um, for the, po the revised policies to include a statement that reads. Um, such conduct is a violation of board policy and may constitute illegal discrimination under state and federal laws. And I move that these, this statement follow or appear in all of the policy statements um, immediately following a listing of those um, examples of discrimination which we do not want to occur. We have a second. <laughs> Thank you. Any further discussion of the amendment? All those in favor of amending of the amendment? Seven. Opposed? Zero. So we now have an amended motion before us. Do we have any further discussion on the amended motion? In that case, I'll call it. All those in favor? Opposed? Seven zero. Thank you. I think we need to go to your code of. Oh, well, do you want, do you just want to go back yeah. and discuss that, or do you want a motion? A motion. I think we need a motion so we can have the dis further discussion. We have an attorney out there who can throw things at me if I'm wrong. Okay, well, I move that we um, delete file ADA, which is school district goals and objectives. That's the wrong one. No, no, scratch that. ADAA. <laughs> ADAA, which is school system commitment to standards for ethical and responsible behavior. I have a motion. Do I have a second? The very last one. <laughs> Trish, thank you. Discussion? No. I didn't know if there was a second. I wanted to hear the discussion. Excuse me? This communication. We're all set. Thank you. Oh, okay. It's ADAA, right? Yeah, it's the very last one, and this is and the one that Rebecca after, right, brought up. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca, would you state it again? What you're asking? What you're asking? Because I thought it was a valid point. Um, right. So I think my original my original question was: Do we feel that the code of conduct is static? And if not, then it needs to be reviewed, and we need to have a policy for such review. But in this this evening. 
um, I have heard that it is actually reviewed, but it's reviewed at the building level and not by the school board, which um, is not what this policy states in of itself. And so I guess the question I pose to myself and to everybody else is, do we feel the school board has a role to play in the review of our code of conduct through all the buildings, district-wide? My gut reaction for me personally is, yes, we do. So, Bob, can I ask you a question? If we delete this policy, is it it, would it do what um, Rebecca is saying is that the school board no longer has a school board policy with reference to the code of conduct? Yeah, it's a, I, I assume that she's correct with that because it doesn't say. Usually in the other policies when it was referred to another section, it would say that. It would say, you know, C policy J something something. Right. This one, um, that could very well be true. Because this just says that they don't feel it's necessary because the school system has already adopted a code of conduct. Um, I don't have a problem either way with this one. But if, if, if we have a code of conduct and we get rid of this particular mm -hmm. one, then the ch any change to the code of conduct would not come to the school board, it would go to a building administrator? and or maybe the superintendent, but not to the school board, then I would be um, inclined to go along with Rebecca. I think that is a, cha a policy change to a code of conduct should be looked at at the school board level. Well, I thought that there was another place in the policy manual that does refer to the code of conduct. Isn't that what we yeah. determined? Jeff, would you? Yeah, Jeff. I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify what it is. We don't change anything about the code of conduct in terms of what are the definitions of acceptable and unacceptable behavior. <clears throat> we do review our handbook, and there's a lot of things in our handbook that have nothing to do with the student code of conduct um, per se. For example, this past summer we changed one um, a couple things dealing with academic um, range and GPA and that sort of stuff. Um, and I think I interpreted your question from the broad. There is some discretion. Thank you. Right. Okay. But Jeff, could I just ask you something? I thought at our meeting, didn't we didn't we find there was at another section of the manual um, reference to the student code of conduct and? My, and I don't have the entire okay. policy manual. <laughs> my recollection is that no. this this particular policy, and maybe one of our particular policies, the first of many, was that the school board some of which are in, in, in this particular um, policy, and that they were included as part of the general review that the state required all schools to have a, to pass a couple of years ago. So there are a whole series of policies that are done. My recollection is that this is the introductory policy, which is then followed by a whole bunch of more specific policies. I don't know if that's I did find a policy CHCA approval of handbooks and directives, but it does not specifically address code of conduct. I don't know, that's not the one I'm thinking of. No, that we looked at. But I, I don't know. I mean, I think that that raises certainly a good, you know, a good question. And maybe that, since we're also not really quite sure, 
if there are other more specific references to this maybe we need to take a closer look at that table it and do that yeah i know the policy committee several years ago did quite an in-depth study of on code of conduct and there were a whole group of policies that were included in that and passed as a group but i don't remember what the policies are and we'd have to look it up just if i could i'm just wondering if um something that jeff said um and it's going to feed off exactly what mary was just talking about i'm wondering if this could be it that when we first started this this was the general umbrella policy then all of the specific policies identifying all the behaviors we we're supposed to cover have now been developed with their own individual policies so perhaps when the attorney was reviewing it they thought we don't need the umbrella anymore because we have all the specific areas are covered with individual policies. Mm -hmm. I don't know that for sure, but I'm wondering from what Jeff said and reminded me of and thinking about that, if that's perhaps where that discussion went to. Well, so it seems that we need to research that a little bit and see what really, you know, we're taking out if we delete this or what we're keeping in if we want to keep it in. So. I think there's sufficient confusion on the issue to send this back to the policy committee, this particular policy back to the policy committee. Can we have a move to table this? Elaine? Um, I'd like to move that we uh, table um, policy ADAA for further consideration uh, by the policy committee. Um, be presented another time. Do we have a second? Kathy, thank you. Any discussion on that? In that case, all in favor? Opposed? 7 0. Um, yeah, I don't know, Ann. Where are we now? So 11 B. Yep. Yep. Um, did we do tobacco use and possession, or? Those were included in the, yeah, in the ones that we approved, I think. Then I have, oh, whatever. The only one we didn't was the VA. Are we satisfied that we're finished with the second reading of policies? Okay. We'll move on to uh, consideration of a Co-curricular fee position of the main learning initiative lead teacher for Cape Elizabeth High School. Bob, do you want to sure. take that on? Um, in your package was a um, laptop teacher leader job description and a, a memo, a, um, an email from Jeff shed to myself that said I'm attaching a draft job description for lead teacher role. The stipended position that will definitely be vacant this year is for mobile lab coordinator. I believe that has at least a thousand dollar stipend, perhaps a bit more. It also seems an appropriate place to draw from. Um, up until this year, uh, laptops were only in the middle school and the state paid a stipend for that person to a thousand dollar stipend for the person to oversee their distribution and problems with them and all that sort of thing. We need a similar person over at the high school and as you can see from the job description, somebody to also, you know, assist the technology crew and be a clearinghouse of information for teachers. Um, regarding uses and all those kinds of things. And so we are recommending that we establish um, this and use the money from this um, unfilled other stipend to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Bob, are you recommending that we adopt this? I am. And how much of a stipend are you recommending? I'm recommending the same stipend as has been in place for the middle school, the $1,000, um, uh, just because that is consistent with what we've been doing in, in another place in the system. And it seems to have worked well there. We have a motion. Elaine? Um, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the uh, laptop teacher leader at the high school level with a $1,000 stipend come from um, an unfilled stipend position at the same school. A second. Thank you, Henry. 
discussion i do have a question um what's happening with the mobile apps it does does it not need anybody to coordinate it or um long story but <laughs> Any other questions or comments? In that case, go ahead, Trish. Just a really quick kind of follow up on Elaine. So, it, this amount is already in the budget, and if we approve this position, then next year will we will this be an incremental position if the mobile lab person goes back into place? Any further discussion? Then I will go back as the board's historian momentarily and remind everyone here that this position that's being recommended, recommended is a function of the co-curricular committee and that because of the need to fill this position immediately, I'm not going to take anyone to task over that issue. Um, and I will let this proceed to a vote. However, in the future, if we are creating new co-curricular committees, that requires convening the co-curricular fee committee. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. 7-0. By the way, now that we've created the uh, the position, do we not also need to fill it? We do. You didn't take your recommendation <laughs> in that. I just realized. Um, could I add it under the other co-curricular fee? You could do it under the co-curricular fee position. Okay, let's do that. The next item is consideration of the superintendent's recommendation for athletic fee positions for winter 2004. Bob? Um, in your package was a listing of uh, positions that, um, of athletic positions that um, are being recommended. They include uh, Jim Ray, varsity boys basketball, Jerry McQueeny, JV Boys Basketball, Ron Kirstead, Varsity Girls Basketball, Doug Worthley, Varsity Indoor Track, David Weatherby, Assistant Indoor Track, Kerry Curtis, Varsity Girls and Boys Swimming, Ben Raymond, Varsity Assistant Swimming, Devin Morrill, Varsity Nordic Ski, Kurt Brown, Assistant Ice Hockey, um, one new coaching recommendation, Cicely Upton, Assistant Nordic, um, and mentioned uh, the credentials, and Robert, I'm sorry, two new ones, Robert Kierstead, JV Girls Basketball. Is there um, the one? I'm sorry, there are, I, there's a second page. Jason Tremblay in ice hockey, Chris Hayward, freshman boys basketball, and Sarah Haskell, JV swimming. We have a motion. I move that we uh, accept the uh, Superintendent's recommendation for the winter coaching positions. A second. 
Thank you, Elaine. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? I'm sorry. I have no right to make any comments because I'm not on the board, but um, Jim Ray has already been appointed varsity boys basketball coach last spring. So we don't need, you don't need to vote on that. Oh, yeah. We did. I I'm sorry, we'll I didn't pick it up earlier. I should have read the list over. I think we'll vote on it regardless. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? 7 0. Um, consideration of the superintendent's recommendation to fill co curricular fee positions for the school year 0405. Bob? Yes, there were a number of positions um, on, I believe, three different pages. Um, and they include um, from the middle school, Kathy Clow, yearbook advisor, Evan Solander, fifth, sixth grade math club, Brian. Chero, thank you. Um, seventh, eighth grade math team, Deb Hannon, student voice, and Pam Vos, student voice. Um, for the World Language Club, co-advisors, Anne Marie Dion or Dion and, and Lisa Leonard. And for um, Special Olympics spring events, Karen Johnson and Kim Han Hanlon. Soccer, Carly Bean, and basketball, Elisa Anderson. Um, those are our recommended. There was Bob, a question. Yes. You also have to add the high school. Oh, and we should add the high school. Mm. Joyce, Joyce Bell. Bell. Coordinator. Joyce Bell. Joyce Bell. What are we adding? Somebody. For the newly created position. Do we have a motion? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for curricular fee positions as presented. A second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? 7 0. The next item is consideration of a request for maternity leave and subsequent unpaid leave. Bob? Yes, we have a request again in your package um, from Gretchen McNulty um, to leave on or about, or her due date is on or about January 31st, um, and after her six to eight week uh, maternity leave to continue on a, uh, an unpaid leave um, after April vacation. Um, and I do recommend that we approve um, that. And that was? Gretchen. Gretchen McNulty. Motion. Thank you, Elaine. I move that we uh, accept the uh, request for maternity leave along with extended uh, unpaid leave for Gretchen McNulty. Second. Second. Thank you, Henry. Any discussion? All those in favor? As opposed? Henry, I thought so. You're not voting. <laughs> What? <laughs> you, we need you to raise your hand for the vote. Um, I, thank you, Henry. I didn't vote. I vote now. Okay, good. <laughs> seven, seven zero. One way or the other. <laughs> Just um, make sure you were awake. <laughs> I, I knew that's what you were doing to me, Henry. It was a test. I understand. Um, the next item, F, is first reading, policy GBO, identification badges, staff. Ann? I'm going to hand this over to Bob because he's the one that um, came up with this. Most certainly. Has the most information on it. I will read it. i uh, try to. Um, this policy is enacted to enhance the identification awareness of all Cape Elizabeth School Department staff and as another measure to assist in the safety of our schools and to alert school personnel to the presence of unauthorized people within the building. All Cape Elizabeth School Department staff will be required to wear a photo identification badge during scheduled work hours. 
Volunteers, substitutes, and all visitors will be required to wear a visitor's ID badge when entering our school buildings. All Cape Elizabeth School Department staff will display their photo identification badge so it is clearly visible. Non-school personnel who are not displaying proper identification will be asked by staff members to report to the principal's office or immediately notify the office that there is a person in the building without proper identification. All school board members, although not considered staff, will wear identification badges when on school grounds and at school functions during school hours within the Cape Elizabeth schools. Upon an employee departure from employment with the Cape Elizabeth schools, she or he will be expected to return his or her identification badge to his or her immediate supervisor. Is this consistent with what the town just did? It's, it's nearly identical. We did change a couple of pieces to fit more the school setting, and uh, we actually used um, Westbrook and some other um, school systems who have adopted uh, badges as our models for uh, the policy. And Bob, I think as we said last time, this is something that's also being instituted across the country. Yes. This is a first reading, so I do not believe we need a motion in a second tonight. Can I just make just one clarification? Yes, Nancy, you have I, to wait I hope I'm doing this correct, because I want to do it in the name of Jen DeSena and other people who were the grammar police, but, um, <laughs> <clears throat> and I, I'm on, now, even though with my very rich language arts background, I may not be on firm ground, I believe on your third paragraph, you might want to just change the wording a little bit um, because we have non-school personnel who are not displaying proper identification will be asked by staff members to report to the principal's office or I think you want to say the staff will immediately Correct. notify the office mm -hmm. for clarification. Correct. Thank you. For the staff. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask a question at this point? Yes. Um, has this been shown to our building administrators and do we have their support in this? Uh, it has been shown to them and we do, do have their support in this. Okay, thank you. Um, one piece I failed to mention is that there will not be a charge for this. This comes under the same um, uh, grant, grant. grant, Federal that, grant. Uh, that the town oh. has used oh. for all of their identifications. Okay. And therefore, um, there will not be, you know, a cost to the school system for it. It is being recommended by the police department as well. And so each year going forward, it will fall under that then because... At this point, yes. At this point. Never say, say all. <laughs> all right. Um, that will come back to us next month for a second reading and adoption. Now move on to G. I'm not sure this requires any official action other than this is a request for a volunteer to be appointed to the Bus Stop Appeals Committee. It's a school board volunteer, Bob? Yes. Um, if you looked at um, policy EE that was in your package, that's an existing policy. Um, the part that I put my rough parentheses around, or we put the, the rough parentheses around, um, an appeals committee comprising the superintendent, a school board member, and the transportation coordinator will review all appeals. And I believe that Sue has said we have three appeals to look at this year. So um, those, uh, we do need a school board member to fulfill that, or that committee um, to review those. Do we have a volunteer? I'll volunteer. Thank you, Henry. And just as a, do I get to appoint Henry or do we have to vote on that? I would vote on it because it, it says a school board member and that's usually a representative. Okay, in that case, can I have a motion to appoint Henry to the, what is this? The Bus, bus Stop, Stop Appeals, Appeals Committee. Bus Stop Appeals Committee. I move that we appoint uh, Henry Adams to the Bus Stop Appeal, Appeals Committee. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Do we have a second? Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, All Rebecca. in favor? Uh, well, is there any discussion? <laughs> well, let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah, is, is, is there a battle over who wants to serve? 
All in favor? Can I vote on this? Yes, Henry, please do. <laughs> Opposed? Uh, it looks like 7 0 to me. Did you vote this time? And the last item we have um, for the new business agenda is the Food Service Task Force report. Kathy <clears throat> has already read the report to us. It is now time for us to consider action on that. So let's begin with a motion. Okay. Um, I read the report as written earlier. Um, we discussed it um, at the Finance Committee and we made some changes to what the recommendations were. So if I can just uh, stop me if I get it wrong, but um, what we want to do is um, in order to resolve current negative financial status on food service accounts, um, I'd like to make a motion that if a lunch account is overdrawn $40 or more, the child will not be allowed to register for community service programs, sports activities, or co-curricular activities until the account is back in a positive status. Second, if a lunch account is overdrawn $40 or more, the child will receive a prepackaged brown bag lunch selected by the lunch personnel. Um, and the rest of it would remain the same as read before about the letters and so forth, unless you want me to read that part again. Yeah. <laughs> but I think we should, but Kelly, I think we just need to. What was read before does not. What what we did clarify. take out. Yeah, just clarify. We what we did. Um, what what we are looking at doing is changing the initial recommendation of twenty dollars overdrawn to forty dollars, and we are um, omitting the requirement that ch that the child call their parent to remind them of the overdue payment. Otherwise, the rest stands as we mentioned earlier. Before we go any further, I just realized I should have gotten a clarification. Bob, can we handle this as a, as a piece of business or as uh, similar to policy as a first reading? Um, no, this is, this is, you have a task force that you have asked to look at an issue and make recommendations. They've made recommendations. You can act on those recommendations. Thank you for the clarification. Do we have a second to the motion? Trish, thank you. Discussion. Oh, fuck. Move fast. Go ahead, Rebecca. Well, I support the first. Um, item, which is the not able to register. I have questions about the second one. We discussed it at the Finance Committee meeting. It's just my concern that perhaps a child may feel um, embarrassed or somehow ashamed um, by being given a bag lunch. But uh, if the board as a whole thinks that's the way to proceed, then I will go along with that. Any other comments or discussion on, on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Rebecca? 6-1, thank you. Um, our last opportunity, comments from the public. I don't see any public here except, um, no, nope, I guess not. Um, before we adjourn, dates to remember, school board workshop, Tuesday, October 26th. Um, the topic is special education. That is at 7 p.m. in the high school library. There is a special school board workshop meeting um, Friday, October 15th, 2004 at 9 a.m. in the William H. Jordan Conference Room. And this is school board goals. And this is the board's goals for itself. Um, the next item uh, meeting is a policy subcommittee committee meeting Tuesday, November 2nd at 12 noon in the William H. Jordan Conference Room. Uh, I don't, I may have skipped it. The special school board workshop is also in the William H. Jordan Conference Room. 
The Finance Committee will be meeting Tuesday, November 9th, 2004 at 6.30 p.m. They usually we put it at 6.30 on this and then they change it if it needs to be changed. I suspect that since that's after uh, excuse me, the tax cap vote, an hour long meeting might, might be appropriate. Um, and finally, the next school board meeting is Tuesday, November 9th, 2004 at 7.30 p.m. in the council chambers. And with that, if there's nothing else, I, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.